then move into the introduction? Uh, yes, I, I've got a couple of stories and in an introduction that I will do, and then, um, yeah, and probably need to introduce you and. Uh, yes. Yes. Okay. Before we start, well, I'm Sarinda Moore. I'm with. I'm a board member of Global Faith in Action. I'm also executive director of Alternative Gifts International, a local nonprofit organization, and um, I'm somewhat kind of the behind-the-scenes person too with uh, Global Faith in Action, doing a lot of uh, kind of setting up. Uh, sessions like this so i'm excited it's the first session for us and uh really thrilled to be here so thanks thanks for doing it uh -huh. yeah and okay and chelsea is um they know that she's going to be do, do they know that they are going to be able to call in or write in or something like that yes yeah so they're monitoring facebook so any questions that might uh comments well, come well, in from there well, they're monitoring. Well, Chelsea's doing that Okay, well, welcome to A Conversation in Action, um, sponsored by Global Faith in Action and the Beyond Tolerance Movement. And I'm Sam, I'm uh, the Executive Director of Global Faith in Action, and uh, uh, some people know me as Pastor Sam, and uh, really uh, anxious to see what we can do with this panel tonight. Um, I I'd like to share a couple of th thoughts first before one is um, a number of years ago, I read a handwritten record. It was done by religious leaders back in the 1880s. And they were, I found this in an old bank vault. And this is what they said their original statement was back then, the religious leaders of our city in the 1800s. They said, this is it. We call people together to build understanding, promote justice, relieve misery, and reconcile the estranged. 120, 30 years ago, that's what they were saying, and we still need to promote justice today, don't we? Now, in 1966, I was a theology student at SMU, and Martin Luther King Jr. had something somewhat similar to say. He said, hey, we, we just happened to have a chance to sit down and talk with him. It was a wonderful time, and he said, you know, um, you, you students, we need you because um, what my job is, is to try to change hearts. And that's what you must be doing also, trying to change hearts. But it's the only way we can, we can eradicate racism, said Martin Luther King Jr. So we were really, um, in any point, all of us, and he said, we need you, we need you. And that's what I'm saying today also. All of you that are on the panel, we need you, we need you, we need you. Now, the last thing I'm just going to say, is, as far as just my little thoughts are, is that um, Martin Luther King's, King's message was not the new idea, uh, really, because back in the 12th century, there was a poet named Rumi, and I happened to be at his gravesite, and, I, and, and above his gravesite it says, beyond our tolerance there is a field. I will meet you there. And that's what we want to do. We want to create a field of somewhere people want to come together and so on. So the reason Global Faith in Action is calling this event tonight is because our sole purpose is to change hearts, to build relationships, to find the field where we will see the beauty in each other. Build relationships with those we do not normally know. Our vision statement, Global Faith in Action's vision statement is a world of faith living together beyond our differences. Our board of directors consists of Muslim, Christian, Jew, Baha'i. We enjoy each other. We love each other. We sponsor dinner dialogues and music events and so together because we want people who don't know each other to get to know each other because we know it takes relationships in order to get uh, this all to, in order to have the kind of world that we want to have. So uh, what is the role of the faith community? Is it possible that we can listen to each other with, uh, with the understanding that we will learn and grow from each other. Well, tonight, that's why we've got this panel. We wanna discuss that. So I'm ready to hear from the panel. And uh, so could we uh, have uh, each panelist right now introduce themselves, say who they are, and uh, what, what, re what 
religious background they may have and um, and what their position is, if they would. Yeah, go ahead and let's, uh, let's hear from you and give us your name first. So let's start with, um, I'm looking at the list of names. So let's just start with Dawn. Um, okay. I'll pop a little list on, on, the, on my view. So let's just start. Okay. With, and then Deborah Thanks. is next. Hi, I'm Dawn Frankfurt. I am the rector of St. James Church here in Wichita. And it's, we're an Episcopal church. Um, and I have lived in Wichita for almost 10 years. I moved here in early 2011. Um, for me personally, I've lived many places in the United States. Um, I grew up in Oklahoma. I've lived in coastal North Carolina. I've lived in Hawaii, where I lived for six years, and really that was a life-changing experience for me um, in terms of finding some comfort about talking to other people about um, race. It was the first place I ever lived where I wasn't in the majority and um, where it wasn't taboo to um, say to somebody else, what are you? You know, what is your race? <laughs> and and to have conversations with other people. Okay. Um, let's um let's let everybody just give a bit of an introduction as to who they are. I want to hear more about what you were saying. Okay. Let's All right. Let's hold on to that for a moment and let's hear from each one of you. Um, Next is Deborah. My name is Deborah Dirks, and my faith tradition is Islamic. Though I am a convert to Islam, having been raised in the Mennonite tradition of Christianity. Over the past 50 years, I have assisted and studied with my late husband, Dr. Gerald F. Dirks, who was a minister of the Methodist Church, receiving his Master of Divinity from Harvard University. He and I both converted to Islam in 1993 having studied Christianity and other religions prior to our entering into Islam gave us a unique insight into interfaith issues. I assisted him in researching and writing his 10 books on interfaith religion and history, focusing on common ground that we can build upon. We traveled the world learning cultures and giving speeches, workshops, training, sermons about interfaith goals and how to reach them. He also assisted me in writing my three books that pertain to religion. The first one was Islam Our Choice, which was nonfiction book telling the stories of six modern American women who chose to become Muslim. The second and third are novels. The Peacemaker Struggle concentrates on the Israeli occupation of Palestine. It also focuses on the American interfaith situation in all its complexity. Race Relations focuses on America's race conflicts over time, bringing it to current times. Interfaith as well as interrace relations are presented. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Uh, next on our um, list is Naim. Naim? Yes, good. Thank you. Uh, first, thank you for uh, creating this panel, inviting me to it. My name is Naim Balut, also known as uh, Hajj Naim. I'm the president of the Ahlul Bayt Islamic Center. It's a new Islamic center open in Wichita, Kansas, on the west side of the town by downtown area. I'm of the Muslim faith. I've been in Wichita since, night, since late 1984. I came from Beirut, Lebanon, a country that was messed up in civil war based on uh, sect, religion, you name it. Shooter, right? So uh, came here, studied at Wichita University, graduated from here. I still work in, uh, in the aerospace industry in Wichita and in Oklahoma City. And looking forward to uh, the discussion as we go forward. Great, thank you. Uh, William Van, you're up next. Oh, yes, good evening. Uh, my name is Dr. William Van. Uh, born and raised right here in Wichita, Kansas. Uh, 2903 9th Street is where I grew up. Uh, I have a, uh, been pastoring for about 25 years now. I pastor a church called I Aces Christian Center. 
uh, before you ask the word ice is, is uh, if you study it in the Greek, the real Greek, it means healing. It was a place of healing water. So uh, Pastor Ice is Christian Center. Um, just born and raised here by my tradition uh, is Pentecostal. I am a born and raised a fourth generation Pentecostal preacher. Uh, so just excited to add my input, uh, especially concerning things that are happening here in Wichita because I've lived here my entire life. And I think that gives me some perspective uh, of the changes that have happened throughout the years. So just blessed to be here. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, next is uh, Richard Kirkendall. I'm Reverend C. Richard Kirkendall, pastor of the Bethany Missionary Baptist Church and also president of the Greater Wichita Ministerial League. I'm also a retired soldier out of the United States Army, I had the opportunity to live around the world and meet a lot of different people. I too was born and raised right here in Wichita, Kansas, and I'm looking forward and thank you. Thank you for inviting me to be a part of sports. Thank you. And um, lastly, we have um, Rabbi Michael Davis. Hi, yes. Uh, my name is Michael Davis. Um, I'm the rabbi at Congregation Emmanuel here in Wichita. I've been here uh, serving this congregation for about 20, almost 25 years. Yeah, almost exactly 25 years. Uh, I'm also on the board of Global Faith in Action. Okay, and we have Chelsea on the line too. Chelsea Whipple, some of you may know, is uh, the wife of Brandon Whipple, our uh, mayor. Um, so Chelsea, if you want to share a little bit about your background and your affiliation with Global Faith in Action? Sure. I know everyone can hear me well. Um, so, yeah. yeah, this is interfering. I am a proud woman. Can you, can, can you send her a chat? Tell me to, to re, 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 restart again. Yeah, her, her internet is uh, you'll, not you'll very to, strong. So to, she, can you take her off and uh, let us get to can you do that? Yeah, Chelsea, we're sorry about that. Chelsea is a, um, is a member of, he's, she's on the board of directors of the Global Faith in Action. This is really Chelsea's idea as to what we are doing today. She's the one who brought up the idea. So sorry we can't get her connection, but can we go on, uh, Surinda, and uh, ask the first question? Let's move on, yes. So the first question okay, is... Yeah, I'll take the first question here. Okay. Uh, what, what does uh, your faith tradition teach about injustice, and what do you feel is your responsibility to respond to injustice? And we'll go in the same order as we just did. So let's start with uh, John. Uh, if you could uh, share from your perspective um, in two or three minutes. Okay. Um, well, we have uh, the same history as other uh, Judeo Christian Christians, Christian traditions um, of God telling us, um, coming to us and saying that our responsibility is to care for the orphaned and the widowed and the alien in a foreign land and that um, good news is being proclaimed to captives and prisoners um, that this is what God intends for the world and it is our intent to continue to proclaim that to the world today. Okay, Thanks. thank you. Um, next is Dawn, uh, Deborah, sorry. Islam stresses that absolute justice is needed at all times and is required of all Muslims. Not that we are capable of carrying that out, but it is our duty. The Quran speaks of the need to never overreact to an injury to you or yours, and that it is your duty to help your brother. But if he is doing something wrong, you have to help him by stopping him with guidance. With that said, it is important to support everyone's rights. 
Peaceful protests are one of these rights. For those who prefer or those who are unable to participate in this way, there are many options. One is the spread of information. Probably more important is meeting people on their own space and in a respectful way. To participate in political agendas, to support those who support your ideas and your ideals, vote, and of course, pray, for nothing positive is accomplished without God's help. Thank you. Uh, next is Naeem. Yes, uh, I'm going to read a short verse of the Quran as a reminder of the injustices. He said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the glory book, he said in Surah 28, verse 5, and we desire to bestow upon favor upon those who have been oppressed into the land and to make them leaders and to make them the heirs. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, glory to be to him. He has informed us in many verses in the Quran to work for justice, to work against oppression and to stand against oppression. He reminded us multiple places that if there's an injustice happening in your community, you have to either change it by your hand if you can, change it by your word if you can, and the least of your action is to pray. So in this time and era, as we go through this episode of injustice against everybody, whether black, white, red, yellow, any injustice is condemned. Any injustice has to be stood against it and to ask for justice for everybody, except for the oppressed one. And if we cannot do it by hand, then our next step is to raise our voices like we're doing right now, educating one another, informing one another, and standing in shoulder to shoulder with the oppressed people. And if we cannot do that, the least we can do is to pray, to pray for patients and to pray for those who are committing such atrocities is to be guided and to come back to the past by asking for God for forgiveness and ask the community for forgiveness as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is William Van. Yes, I think that uh, uh, certainly our faith tradition teaches that we should pray, first of all. Uh, but then also I think that as the scripture says, as you've done to the least of these, you've done it unto me and how we can, uh, if our brother offend us, uh, that we should actually give him our cloak, give him our cloak. And so I think that one of the keys is that we have to allow uh, God to guide our hearts. But then at the same time, the scripture does say, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. But also, I believe that God uses the hands and feet of people uh, to bring about change in the earth. And so if he has empowered us and uses our hands and feet, then we are the ones who have to take action in order to uh, kind of stop the injustices that we see happening. And I think as a believer, it is in fact our responsibility as, as being a believer that we stand up for the injustices that we see. And if as a believer, we are silent in this time when we need to be speaking, then we actually enable the injustices in society to, to continue. So whatever your religion is, whatever your faith is, you have to open your voice, open your mouth and speak against the things. Even if it becomes difficult and challenging, you have that responsibility. I believe God has given all of us that charge. Thank you. And uh, next is, um... Well, it says Deborah under your name, but that's not right. Deborah's already gone. Uh, Naheema has also. Um, so last is President Richard Kirkendall, or Reverend Kirkendall. The Old Testament book of Isaiah says, I, the Lord, loves justice. I believe as faith leaders, we all have a responsibility to speak out against injustice. And it's well said, injustice anywhere is injustice everywhere. We've been taught the golden rule of the Bible, Matthew 7, 12, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And my grandmother simply said it like this, treat people the way you want to be treated. 
and that I believe that we have a responsibility not to stick our head in the sand and act like we don't see injustice or be so overwhelmed with fear until we don't want to speak out against it because we think it might cause us some kind of social harm or something. No, we have to have a godly boldness about us to stand up for what's right. Regardless of the creed, color, your religion, it doesn't make any difference. Right is right and wrong is wrong. And we have an obligation to stand for what's right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, next is Rabbi Michael Davis. Thank you. Yes. Um, going back to the, in the Torah, in, the, in Deuteronomy, we are told, Zedek, Zedek, Tiodof, justice, justice shall you pursue. And this shows us two things, I think. One is that justice is that important that it's repeated justice justice shall you pursue and the other is that it's not an easy thing that is something that is that must be pursued in order to um uh, to to be there the um the prophet amos tells us to hate evil and love what is good and to establish justice in the gate in other words we must uh, establish courts of justice we must establish justice in the cities and in our towns, um, and we find if we, we that justice is the center of the Jewish faith, but also that um, that the laws that we find in the Torah uh, primarily have to do with with defending the weak and limiting the power of the oppressor. Whether the oppressor is someone who loans money, someone who employs you, the government, whatever it is. So most of these laws dealing with justice deal with, with protecting those who are weak. Uh, and many of the laws that we are given in the Jewish tradition, you know, we find in the Torah and in the Bible, um, are tied with the expression, for you were slaves in the land of Egypt, or you were a stranger there. So all of these laws that, uh, that Mother Dawn mentioned, the uh, protecting the widow and the orphan and the stranger, uh, all of these laws come to play in order to save uh, those who are powerless. The, uh, in fact, we find in the Mishnah, which is a compendium of Jewish law that's written about 2,000 years ago, and you may have heard this from other sources, Her ba'al olam al inveh hadin va'al invut hadin. That is, the sword comes to the world because of justice delayed and justice denied. We must take action when justice is denied and justice delayed is often the same as justice denied. Within the Reformed Jewish tradition, um, that is the progressive Jewish tradition of which I am a, a member, um, we are especially called to take the ethical teachings that we have been given to, to address the inequities and, and the justice and injustice in society today. Um, what what Reverend Sharpton said at the funeral uh, the other day was so crucial and something that we need to remember. He said that the, that the black community uh, is in a situation, in the situation that it is because there has been a boot upon their neck. Uh, with slavery, Jim Crow, unfair housing laws, unfair economy, unequal education opportunities, and the bias, acknowledged or not, in the rest of, rest of us. So we are called as, as Jews to work for tzedek, to work for justice for all, especially those who have been kept down, those who have been pushed down, those who have been held back. And that is the place of justice and injustice within Jewish tradition. Thank you. Okay, next question. Okay. Um, how can you, or do you, reach out to others in the community that are different than you are, either racially or religiously or economically or ethnically? And if you have reached out to others, what has it taught you personally as a faith leader? Who shall we begin with? Well, I thought we'd change it up a little bit and perhaps start with Reverend Kirkendall. Um, this well, time. okay. God bless you. Uh, I've learned for the most part that we have more in common than we do different. And I believe we need to learn how to embrace each other's differences. No two people are alike. And though we may disagree, 
we have to learn to disagree and, and, and not be disagreeable, which means we, we try to understand and embrace each other differences in our life. Because once again, I say we have more in common than we have differences. And I believe that right now there's a spirit going around that's causing us to divide because of our differences. When I think when we do what we're doing right now, break bread with each other and get to know each other, that it makes it easier for us to understand and get to know each other a little better and, uh, and not be so critical of each other of what we think might be different from us and not be afraid of it either. Thank you. Next, let's go with um, Naeem. We can't hear you. I'm sorry, I put myself on mute. I tell my worker not to do that and I do that myself. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's a reminder for everybody. Uh, in, in the Holy Quran, Allah addresses this and he says, we have created you from tribes and nations only to get to know each other and to know one another. We are all human beings. We are being, being created in the same way. We do have, we come into this, to this dunya or to this earth with different colors and shapes and different tradition, different religion, but we all have one common thing. We all are a human being. We share the same blood. I think we do, how, we do fall short. I speak of myself for now reaching out to the rest of the community to get to know everybody better. I think it will be better for everybody if we open our places of worship to get to know our community as a whole. One organization to another organization, one group to another group to get to know one another. Thank you. Um, Don Frankfurt. Uh, I, I agree with what you said about um, getting to know one another. Some of the things that we already do um, in the Episcopal Church are to offer some social services to people in our community through Breakthrough ESS and um, through St. Francis Ministries. Breakthrough ESS serves um, the most um, the homeless the mentally ill and those who are unemployed in our community. And um, we have a migration ministry for refugees through St. Francis Ministries. But also about um, getting to know one another in community. I think what I've been becoming so uh, readily aware of just, I mean, right now is that we can no longer just extend the invitation to invite people to come to our worship place and make it welcoming to others. We've been trying to make it welcoming to anyone who would come and be with us uh, for as long as I can remember. I think um, the challenge before us now is to go to others and to, um, to be invited, but to um, to seek out knowing others and not just leave it to an invitation for them to come to us. Thank you. Deborah? Thank you. Sister Deborah, you're on mute as well. <laughs> we can't hear you. I'm sorry. I followed Naeem's examples. <laughs> I think it is, it is very important as we are all talking about the, the need for us to reach out and to get to know each other and to do for each other. I think that as we look at this, recognizing that all of these religions teach these values that they all have a, um, a core that gives us the basic values of dealing with humanity and that it is important in every one of them 
um, earlier, someone, and I'm sorry, I do not remember who, was referring to a biblical passage um, that is very similar to this hadith. God's apostle said, Verily, God, the exalted and glorious, will say on the day of resurrection, O son of Adam, I was sick, but you did not visit me. He will say, O oh my Lord, how could I visit thee when thou art the Lord of the worlds? Thereupon he will say, Did you not know that a certain servant of mine was sick? But you did not visit him. Now I'm sure you all recognize this in the Gospels as well. But um, I think it's interesting that the story appears in so many different places. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, next is um, Pastor Van. Yes. Uh, I think I think one of the critical things is we have to build relationships uh, that allow us to see and experience others in more than just a one-dimensional or superficial kind of way. And when we begin to establish and build those relationships, those have to be done on purpose. It will require your time, your talent, and your treasure, and your effort. And so the first thing we have to ask ourselves is, Am I willing to risk it? Because when I reach my hand across the fence to touch somebody else, I run the risk of rejection. I run the risk of hatred. I run the risk of developing a new friend. But I have to be willing to venture out and, and, and say it's worth the risk to establish these relationships. It's interesting. Uh, when Jesus was talking to his disciples, I think it was in the Gospel of St. Matthew and, and St. Mark, and he asked him, he said, uh, who do men say that I am? And they gave a testament of, of him being uh, Elijah's, uh, one of the prophets, uh, uh, John the baptizer. Uh, and then he asked him, but who do you say? And when they asked him that, Peter stood up and Peter didn't respond because he could have said, hey, uh, you're Mary's son. Uh, you know, you're, you're an olive skinned guy with thick curly hair. He could have said all of these different things, but he didn't describe anything physical about him. He described the character of Jesus' heart, which means he had to have relationship with him enough, ups and downs, goods and bads, uh, great days, bad days to know who he really is. I think one of our, our, our most difficult challenges is we see people, we see a, a 10 minute synopsis of somebody's life or a 10 second synopsis of somebody's life. And we wanna base a whole culture or a whole group of people upon that snapshot. But when you look at somebody in a 10 minute, I could look at anybody that's on this panel for five seconds and point out flaws. But if I spend time with you and build relationship, now I have enough data that supersedes any flaws that you might have because we have broke bread, as many have said, we broke bread together, we spent time together, we've been in Colonia, we've had fellowship with one another. And I think that in order for us uh, to break down this, this racial barrier, I think it's gonna require us developing relationships outside of our culture. And they have to be on purpose. We gotta know they take time, we got to know that it's a risk of rejection, but we've got to know that it's worth the risk. Absolutely. Uh, Rabbi Davis? Thank you. Um, I'd like to actually take a little bit further from what Dr. Van said. Um, yes, we need to establish relationships. Uh, that's what we do with the Global Faith in Action Dinner Dialogues. And certainly as a police chaplain, I go into people's homes and try to learn a little bit about them. But I think it's, it takes it, we need to take it a step further. Besides just learning who they are and getting friendly with them, we have to understand their fears. And, um, and that's, I think, what I'm seeing in society today, that we each have our own fears, our own hopes, our own dreams, but we do not recognize those of other people. If you look at how society is responding to uh, what has been going on recently, with, uh, with protests, 
as well as responding to the uh, to the coronavirus, uh, you see people who are who are surprised. They are surprised at the protest because they are not seeing the problem from the perspective of the victims of the problem. And I mean, I can um, uh, I can only imagine what it's like to be a first generation Muslim in America. I can only imagine what it's like to be an African American who because of their appearance, knows that they are considered the other. Um, and everybody has, every group has their own uh, fears and hopes and experiences that we don't understand since we're not part of that group. And so we need to get to know each other, but we get to, need to get to know how the other person thinks and how they feel and how they fear and how they dream. Thank you. Sam, back to you. Wow, this is really exciting to hear what everyone's saying and, and how all of us see it's so important to reach out beyond the walls of what we have within our own faith traditions or where we are. It's exciting to hear. And I also am, am learning that there are some questions coming in. So eventually we'll be having some questions from the community around also that are listening to us. But right now our question is, we are also still in the midst of a global pand pandemic and are all navigating this unprecedented time together. We're doing it together, but the pandemic is shown to affect everyone, but disproportionately affecting those of color more. What do you feel is your responsibility to respond to the community during this time? Okay, let's start with Dawn. Okay, well, um, the first responsibility is to take seriously what is happening and to um, continue to do things that will keep not only ourselves, but our neighbors healthy. And um, to do that and to set the example that those sorts of things are valuable to do. Also, um, to be reminded that in any time we have not known what the future is going to be. We are acutely aware of that now. We have no idea what the future is going to be. But we also have no idea what the limits of what God can do are. And that our hope is God can uh, forge a way through this that we can't imagine. That our hope is in the future and trusting God. Uh, we put our faith there. Thank you. Naeem? Yes. Uh, first and foremost, uh, it's very important to educate our community and to let them know the risk that's going on with this pandemic. Another thing that I thought of is not to place anybody at risk. That's because you have the feeling that you need to open your center or your place of worship to take a risk and affect uh, people who uh, have a weak immune system. It's important to reach out to the poor and needy in our community to let them know that financial support uh, is available, the food and supply is available, uh, protective equipment is available. And not only that, at least to listen to their concern, give them an ear, give them the time for them to show their fear, their concern, and let them know that you are standing by them, you are hearing their concern, and you are willing to be there for them when the time comes. It's a reminder from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, from God. It's for us is to humble ourselves. This virus that came in, this pandemic, it came in not to the rich, not to the poor, not to the black, not to the white, not to the yellow. It came to everybody that affected by it. It's to humble everybody to remind them, you are still a servant of God. You're still a minute in the eye of magnificent God. You're still small 
to the large vast in God's mercy. So humble yourself a human being. Humble yourself. Educate one another. Take care of one another. Don't forget one another. Thank you. Um, Pastor Van? Yes, I think uh, concerning the, the pandemic that's happening, uh, as a matter of fact, one of our parishioners was at the brink of, of death with COVID-19. Uh, we thank God that <clears throat> our prayers and faith and her family was able to bring her out of it. Uh, she's in a rehabilitative hospital right now after being in the physical hospital for seven weeks. Uh, so we do have some experience, but concerning this as, as a person of color, and how uh, it seems to be disproportionately affecting uh, people of color more. The first thing that I want to do is examine what are the other factors that are putting communities of color at risk. And uh, within those factors, what are the ones that are within our capacity to change? Because there are certainly some extenuating factors that we have no control over. But there are some factors that are within our capacity to change, and I really am pushing on that. And one of the big ones is developing a, a simply a healthier lifestyle. That is, for the most part, even though there are food deserts, there are all of these different things that happen in a myriad of communities, it is within your capacity to develop a healthier lifestyle, even if that means getting up and walking 100 feet and walking back. You have to take some things within the grasp of your power and, and say, I'm going to make necessary changes in order to be uh, live healthier or be beneficial to my life. And so as a person of color and as a pastor of a church whose church was affected by uh, the pandemic, I am encouraging uh, people, and I believe it's my responsibility uh, to be a beacon of hope and, uh, in our community and uh, to encourage others to look at the patterns of their life that needs to be changed and make those effective changes. Yes, there's some things you can do nothing about, but uh, eating a little bit more healthier is something that you can potentially do something about. And if it's within our power to do something about it, then I think we should. And that's critical for communities of color. Um, Deborah? Dr. Van mentioned walking 100 feet or 100 yards to get some exercise. I would like to encourage everyone who is walking that extra 100 feet or yards to drop off at a neighbor's home some food or um, offer to take a neighbor who needs a ride to a doctor's appointment. All of these things, which you can do easily in a mask and, and keep your social distancing, all of these things make a difference to how this world comes out of this pandemic. And we come out closer together if we care for one another. In this sense, we are our brothers and our neighbors keepers. Thank you. Reverend Kirkendall. Well, during this period of COVID-19, I had to share with our congregation and others that it wasn't an insult to our faith, a challenge to our faith, to start obeying the social distancing laws. We have an obligation to also have a great faith, but also obey the law of the land. And even though we're social distancing, we're not spiritually distancing. And that we uh, uh, have to do what's best for mankind as a whole to make sure that we protect ourselves from them and we protect them from us by wearing our mask and doing the things that we've been asked to do. And I find comfort in the scripture, Proverbs 3, uh, verses 5 and 6, Trust in the Lord with all thy heart, and lean not to your own understanding, but in all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your path. In, in this time of uncertainty, uncertainty when things are just changing, look like every day you go to bed and wake up, 
something else is going on. And I find that we have to just start putting our trust in God and also getting out, like I believe uh, uh, someone just mentioned, and trying to help each other in this time of need and, and know that we're not in this thing by ourselves. That we're all in this together. And as long as we all pull together and, 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 and obey what has been directed by the governor and other places, that, that we'll get through this. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Rabbi Michael? Thank you. Yes. I, I, what does the Judaism teach about this? First of all, is to accept reality. I mean, this is reality. This is something that's going on here. Uh, the science is the science. And uh, what is happening is unfortunately happening. Um, we also teach, uh, especially our, our children who are, who are uh, learning our traditions and, and growing up to becoming adults, we teach them the importance between, um, between freedom and responsibility, that we acknowledge our freedom and we are uh, thankful for our freedom, but all with the freedom comes responsibility. And I'm, I'm sorry to say that there's so many people who emphasize the freedom with a, a lack of responsibility. And so we would teach that um, as well. Certainly uh, what, what Deborah mentioned of, of making sure that other people are taken care of, certainly as others mentioned, to make sure that our community, while we are distant physically, we are certainly not distant uh, emotionally and, uh, and electronically. Um, and also primarily our first response, our first uh, um, uh, priority is people's health. And so everything else has to go out the window in order to preserve people's health. And that is the number one. When we have now over 110,000 Americans uh, dead because of this, we have to do what we can do to preserve health. And while there are those who are afraid for our economic health, first comes our personal health. And that, that must be our, our number one priority. Thank you. Okay, Sam, back to you with the next question. Yeah, this, this question will be the last question before we'll see whether we've got some questions from the community that we'll want to answer. But this question is, when you learn about others who experience life differently or think differently, even to the point of creating societal disruption, how does your faith tradition call for you to respond to such people? We're going to start with Deborah this time. Well, I'm going to give you a verse from the Quran, 548b. To each among you have we prescribed a law and an open way. If God had so willed, he would have made you a single people. But his plan is to test you in what he hath given you. So strive as in a race in all virtues. The goal of you all is to God. It is he that will show you the truth of the matters in which you dispute. So to strive as in a race in all virtues, a Muslim is to relate to a non-Muslim as though each were in a race to perform good works. The earthly sojourn of mankind is the universal race in which all of humanity is engaged and men and women should compete with one another in the, prefer in the performance of all virtues. This is a healthy competition prescribed by Islam, a competition to do for the sake of God, a competition that sees our non-Muslim neighbors and the general public as our fellow members of the human race. Thank you. Pastor Van? Uh, I think that how can we take the knowledge of learning about others uh, others different from you and address the crises and the societal disruption that calls? I think that one of the critical things is uh, I believe that every every culture has codes. Every religion has codes. Every culture has, has codes 
um, the rules, norms, uh, and which is a part of, of, of that culture. And so as we begin to experience and learn other cultures, I think it's critical for us to recognize uh, the codes that are a part of that culture. Not all codes are written. Some are just learned. And so if you grew up African-American, as, as I did, there's just some things that you know, uh, that you recognize. And so if you didn't grow up as an African-American, it sounds foreign to you. But for somebody like me, it's just a part of my culture. So that creates a barrier. If you don't understand the codes of my culture, I can say something that would offend you. But in my culture, it's normal. And so I think as we're learning and developing relationships and experiencing one another, I think even if you got to jot it down, you need to write down some of those cultural codes that help you navigate a, 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 a race that is foreign to you. And when you learn those codes, then when you step in those environments and those situations around those people, that doesn't mean that you act uh, indifferent or you act like, uh, you're just like one of them. No, but what it does mean is I understand and appreciate your culture enough to learn enough about it that I can actually function in that environment and I can be embraced in that environment because I become a part of that environment by understanding and recognizing cultural differences and the codes that are a part of cultural differences. Thank you. Rabbi Davis? Um, yeah, I, I think when it comes to responding, uh, taking the knowledge that there are other people besides you, um, one of the things that I try to express to folks in my community comes from a, a style of biblical interpretation, basically saying how much the more so. Everyone here is suffering. Everybody is suffering with the and with the uh, pandemic. Everybody is suffering, and I reach out to them and I say, "I know you're suffering, but think about the people who don't have what you have. You're suffering, and you have a nice home, and you're and you're confined in your home with your family, which for most people is a good thing. Um, but imagine if you don't have family. Imagine if you don't have home. Imagine if you're not secure in your food." Um, how much the more so is this, um, what we're all suffering through, how much more so is it difficult for them? And we should consider that and not only be grateful for what we do have, but also reach out and help others. Thank you. Don? The Episcopal Church is an Anglican communion from which we come is the tradition that is a bridge between the Roman Catholic Church and the Protestant Christian Church. And we call ourselves the middle way because we hold on to some things that are characteristically Roman Catholic and we hold on to some things that are Protestant. Like several of you have said, no matter our differences, we all have some things in common. And that's what's important to Episcopalians, that we find the thing which is in common. Um, we believe in a big tent so that everyone is welcome under the tent and that we can exist in harmony under the big tent um, and disagree with each other at the same time. Um, what I mean about finding something in harmony with one another is, for instance, in a, con in a congregation like mine, if not everyone um, yet agrees or understands what white privilege is, how can we find a place of, where can we stand in a place of agreement and move the conversation forward? It's important for us to find the place where we can all agree first mm -hmm. 
so that we can move the conversation forward. Um, if we just stay at two polarized ends, we don't think that we will be able to move the conversation forward. So uh, the middle way to us is very valuable. Thank you. Naeem? Yes. Uh, where do I start here? Uh, get a short story here. Uh, Imam Ali, alayhi salam, the commander of the faithful, addressing his deputy, the governor of Egypt. He said to him, all human beings are brethren, either they're brother to you in religion or brother to you in Islam. It is to stand with one another and to get to know one another. Treat your people in your state evenly and equally. It doesn't matter the race, the creed, the religion, or the sect. We are all called by, by God is to serve one another or to help one another. There's so much knowledge to be shared and learned from each other. We don't hold the whole truth. We hold part of the truth, and you might hold the other part of the truth. So let us all get together and learn about one another. Just like Brother Van said earlier, there's so much to learn from one another. There's so much culture to know from one another. It's better to get to know each other and spread that knowledge to the rest of your congregation to get to know each other. Thank you. Reverend Kirkendall? Yes, I'm going to have to piggyback off what Don said, that through these crises, regardless of our race and religion, we have to find a happy medium to where we all can socially get along. We have to start being honest and real with each other and quit saying, telling each other what we think we want to hear to make it through the moment. It's time to be blatantly honest with each other, you know, and not be hypocritical. You know, First John 4 and 20 says, whoever claims to love God and yet hate a brother and a sister is a liar. Whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. It's really time for us to be real with each other because we're facing pandemics and some issues that, that is affecting each other. And, you know, I, I'm going to bring up a old hurtful story of when Rodney King, he never really, I never heard him claim to be a Christian, Muslim, anything else. But after he got the stew beat out of him by the LA police officers, it was a couple of weeks later, he comes back. I was expecting him to give this speech speech where he was going to promote hate and whatever, but he said something simple that should apply to all of us today. Can we all just get along? What's really preventing us from just putting aside some differences and just getting along? And so that's what I believe right now we need to do, is our best to just get along. Thank you. Sam. Yeah. Do we, um, do we, do we have questions coming in that you we do. listed? You want to read one of them? I, I've got I one going to come on the phone here, but uh, you go ahead and read what you have there. Yeah, I have quite a few from, um, I have a little one joining me here too. So, mm. okay. So uh, the first question is, what is the solution for racism and how do we eliminate it? And let's start with, Pastor Man. I think one of the critical solutions for racism or to eliminate racism is, I think as Pastor Kirkendall said, to be honest. And it, it's time to challenge people. How many of us in this conversation have left a meeting and thought I should have said something? Mm -hmm. I promise you we all have. I, I should have spoke up. And we have to address these uh, issues head on, which means when you see it creeping its ugly head up, you need to address it. Not in a way that's necessarily going to cause violence or, or harm, but it needs to be called out. Number one, because some people just don't know. If they don't understand the culture, they don't know that what they're saying is offensive. But if once somebody brings it to their attention, then at least they have opportunity to make adjustment. So how are we going to end racism? And uh, we have to address it head on. We've got to speak to it. And we have to recognize that racism at its core 
is a condition of the heart. And you cannot legislate a condition of the heart. The heart has to be changed. And so no matter what you put, uh, what kind of laws we put in place, all of those different things, until a person's heart sees you different, they will never adjust their behavior permanently. They'll adjust it while they're in the room, but then they'll go home and have the same conversations. So racism, the cure to racism is for people to adjust the heart. How do you adjust the heart? You adjust the heart by getting to know somebody more than just a superficial way. As it's been said throughout the panel, you break bread, you have a relationship enough until you recognize them as an individual. One other thing I wanna to add to that, also in addressing it, you have to address people on the same level. In other words, if, if you're the cashier and I'm the person uh, that's buying groceries, I don't see you as an equal. I see you as the person that's, that's either uh, ringing up my groceries or sacking my groceries. Until I put you on equal playing field, that is the first step where we'll have honest and open dialogue. Not you above me, not me above you, but equal playing field. Now we can have dialogue that begins the healing bridge to end racism. Thank you. Deborah? Healing racism is, is, reminds me of when I was a little girl. We were in the middle of the Cold War where there was so much anger. They were teaching us to duck under our desks, duck and cover. I don't know whether any of you can remember that, but it was um, in case of an atomic bomb going off, we were supposed to climb under our desks. Um, as I came home one day and you know, I was talking about those mean Russians who have these bombs, etc. My mother stopped me mid-sentence and said, you know what? I bet there are little girls in Russia who would like to play with your dolls. And it stopped me because it made it a real person. The Russians sound so vague it's it you can blame them for everything but when it was a little girl that wanted to play with my doll i was ready to share my doll and i think that solving racism has a lot of those same things we have to learn to put each other on an equal basis but also on a personal basis because the studies that have found that the one thing that overruns prejudice is having a personal relationship with someone who fits that group that you are prejudiced about. And so it's very important that we reach out and that way overcome racism on a personal basis. Thank you. Uh, Reverend Kirkendall? Well, I believe that Dr. Van, I believe, said it. It, it. It's an inside job. It's a heart change. It has to take place. You know, we call America the great stew pot because like stew, it has so many different ingredients and flavors in it. But if you're a cook, you know stew isn't good until it started to blend together and mix up with each other. And the problem is we're still in the pot, but we're still separated by hunk. We haven't started to blend together and really, really get to know each other. And I think we all agree that's not really an easy thing to do because sometimes when people don't really trust you, like I said earlier, they tell you what they think you want to hear. And it's time for us, if we're going to overcome if we're going to have true brotherly love and sister with each other and, and get to know each other and really talk about things that really bother you, I don't know it bothers you unless you tell me it bothers you and really break bread together. And I think what we're doing right now, really getting to know each other, is a good start. People of different walks of life, of different religions, of different races, coming together and really, really getting to know each other. I, I, I'm so blessed because I, I grew up in a neighborhood that was so mixed. To tell you the God's truth, 
I didn't really experience the Martin Luther King experience because the neighborhood I li lived in was black, white, and Spanish, and we wasn't bused to school. We all walked to the same school. It was only after the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King that I realized how much hatred it was in the world and, and how much work we had to do. So I, I truly believe that it starts on the inside and sharing with each other. That's why I want to say thank you to whoever idea this was to bring so many different people together from different walks of life. I believe this is where it begins. Naeem? I think that... Um, I came... Go ahead. Go ahead, Dr. Sam. No, 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 no. Um, I came from a different background. So I, I came from a country that didn't have different races until I reached to this country. So we all have one race in Lebanon, and mostly are of, of Arab descent. We came to the United States and we did find, we got the Indian American, we got the African American, we got the Oriental, we got the Hispanic, we got everybody there. So it was, it was a shock for us to get to know one another and to learn from one another. We go to the university, we meet everybody there, get to know them. I think I share with uh, Dr. Vance I, I, there that we have to educate people, and we have to address it. I think addressing the issue is the opening of the door. Educate in order to eradicate. You have to educate the masses, educate the people to eradicate the symptoms or the virus that we have of racism, of looking at one another from a different color and thinking there are different people. That's very important to address. And it is true. It's back, back to the heart. God said, I don't, I'm not, said, you're not going to change the people unless they change from themselves within themselves. The start of the change is within you. You have to change yourself. You're not asking people to change who they are. It's you who have to change. If you have to change your own, your own evolution, start your own revolution from inside to outside and reach out across the street to your neighbor who is different than you. Get to know that neighbor. Get to know the neighbor next to your left, to your right. Get to know your, your schoolmate and your coworkers from different races and different culture. That way, when you speak, you can hear in their voices what aches them, what, what pain they go through. You don't know it. You can read it in the, in, in the book. You can read it in a magazine, in, in a newspaper. You have to live it in order for you to, in order for you to, and to understand. You have to experience it yourself. And getting to know somebody who's been through this it will help us just to understand where they're standing, where they're speaking of. Thank you. Sam, were you going to say something before Naeem spoke? No, no. No, I, no go ahead. Finish that one and then I, if, okay. if there are others that still have something to say, yes, they should. Well, I was going to say that it's uh, five past eight right no. now and we've got quite a few questions to get through and then one final question. I don't know what the questions are, so you, you add. Okay, so Wait, let's here's the final question again. Okay, so let's just continue with the question that was just asked regarding racism. Um, what's the solution to eliminate racism? And Don, if you could respond to that. I'm glad to be called on now because I have a question. You know, um, we the topic of um, Rodney King was brought up, and that phrase that he said at the time which seemed so great about can't we all just get along in this moment i'm i heard that as um a danger a dangerous phrase and i want to tell you that um ask you from your point of view it seems to me that just getting along with everybody acting like is is acting like everything is fine and sweeping everything under the rug and not addressing the topic head on and i think that has what is what people in the majority white people have used for a long time not to address the issue is to say let's not have difficult conversations Let's just get along. And I think what the protesters in the streets are trying to say is, we can't go on doing that anymore. So 
the question I have for you is, if we're not going to go on doing that, then what? Um, how shall we enter into conversation? And I think what we're doing right now, um, having this panel and starting to figure out how to talk about these things, um, is offering us an opportunity to figure out how not just to get along, but to figure out how to do it better. Sure. John, was that a question to me? Yeah, on? yeah, yeah. I'd like to hear. I think when you when you look at Rodney King's story in context, he was actually stopped and he was beat by police. When they was found innocent, the city of California of Los Angeles burnt down and he was dismayed by the whole thing. He was hurt. He's the one that really took a beating. It started with him, but it amazed me that after all he's been through and everything he saw in his heart, it was a kid's heart, a child's heart. He says, couldn't we all just get along? I think he was saying at the end of the day, he said, we're all just human. Yes, we have our differences. Yes, there's some terrible things going on. And I lived the life of a black man and I've been experienced the black experience of a black man. And you know, if I, as I look at it, you know, I, I wonder why, why in the world that this guy from Virginia, and I say that because I had an incident with a guy from Virginia, he was a police officer. He pulled me over and asked me for my license and registration. When I handed it to him, he dropped it on the ground. He said, get out of the car in and pick it up. I had to watch every step and explain to him exactly what I was doing to get out. And I was afraid, but you know, as I'd have matured in life now, I'm not afraid anymore, but I'm afraid for my kids because that kind of stuff is going on. But at the end of the day, can we? Can, I, I say it again: Can we all just try to get along and make a better world out of this? You know, we all believe in a supreme being, and if we believe in that, we got to believe that He has some kind of power to make it so we can all uh, uh, do what they request of us: love each other, try to get along, get with each other. We could talk about it. You don't have to agree with me, but we can agree to disagree, but we don't have to be disagreeable. Right, right, mm -hmm. right. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I'd you. like to add without going too far. I, I agree with uh, Pastor Kirkendall. I think that he was really just saying that can't we just all be in this world together? Sure. But I would also say to the fact that until you see me as equal, Mm -hmm. I don't think we'll ever just get along. Until you can look at me and see me as an equal person to you, because I think one of the, the ladders in racism is status, whether you're equal beneath me or, or above me. And until you can see me as equal, then you'll always subconsciously even put me on a, a, a beneath status. Right. And I think that one of the problems, I'm gonna call it like it is, with white people is they've seen themselves in this place of dominance for so long until right. number one, they're afraid to lose that position of power. Yeah. Even though just by, as the years go by, the world's becoming more people of color, but they're afraid to lose that place of power, number one. Number two, uh, I still think that they see themselves as superior. And as long as you view me from a superior uh, link in life, you'll never place me on an equal playing field. So how can we get along? First of all, we've got to be on equal playing fields. Thank you. Thank you. Deb, um, Sam, Sam chimed in again. Um, well, I'm just wondering that uh, if there are other questions that have come in, because I, I don't have one. I don't have any questions on my calendar, on my. There are several <coughs> questions. The concern is, do we have enough time? Because no, we've got 50 we, don't, we don't have a lot of more time. So right. we need to close this. So uh, I is, think this is a real big question that we should respond to yet. That's from community government because I'm not getting them on my phone. Okay, so there is one good question and, and it's kind of related to our final question Let's let, uh, let you give that question and okay. then let anyone who wants to respond and well, three or four respond and then we'll go to the final. Okay, so the last question is, what will you as faith leaders do 
in your community to create meaningful change. And let's begin with Rabbi Davis. Oh, um, that's a really good question. I, I think that all we can do as leaders of a faith community is to speak to our community. Um, my father used to say, and I've tried to say it a few times too, I don't speak for my community. I speak to my community. And that's what I need to do. Um, I need to try to raise an awareness that racism is an issue that they may see only temporarily. They may see part time and realize that other people see it throughout their entire lives, generation after generation. I can try to teach them that uh, in addition to all the wonderful ideas that we've heard from the other folks in these little windows, um, also there's the, there's the little wedge. There's that little tiny thing that we say or do or believe that, that we don't even think about, but it, 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 um, it's the wedge towards an attitude of racism. Um, I also want to teach the folks in my community that um, as uh, Reverend Kirkendall indicated, there are people who don't even, who are privileged, who don't know they're privileged. They just assume that this is the way it is and this is the way it's always been and this is the way it's going to be. And they don't realize from someone else's perspective that they are in a position of, of the haves when there's so many who do not. So I think the first step, to go back to the earlier question, the first step is you gotta want to. You have to want to. And, and that's what I can try to do with my community, is to help them learn the importance of wanting to be a part of the solution to racism. Thank you. Naeem? Uh, sorry, what was the question? Forgot, <laughs> sorry. I was writing something down. No, that's fine. Uh, what will you as a faith leader do yes. in your community to create I got it. change? Thank you. Uh, first, is first and foremost, uh, back to education. Uh, the first ayah in the Quran that came out is about the God speaking to the Prophet saying, Iqra, read. That was the first command for the human being is to read, educate, get to know, get to learn. It's very important to hold informative meetings and to educate educate our community members and our congregation members to hold seminars and speak about injustices, speak about sharing information, speak about connecting with other community members as well. Let our congregation members become the change agents for the community as a whole. I know it's going to be, in the beginning, it's going to be, going to be hard, it's going to be difficult to go through that, that one phase, but you have, to, you have to start, as they say, the, the mile race starts with the first step. You're going to take that first step throughout that door and then keep on going. And hopefully we'll have the support of the community and the support of the group that we have here on this new Zoom meeting is that we take that step forward so we can meet in the middle of the way and get to know one another and get to meet one another and then learn about each other's cultures, practices, religion, behavior, anything that actually in, in, in enrich our life by getting to know more of what we know now. We don't hold all the knowledge, we just hold part of the knowledge. So let's go ahead and get to know the other person so we can have, add to our knowledge, they can add to their knowledge as well. Thank you. Don? Um, I feel like these are little things that I'm gonna say, um, but there are things that we're doing in my congregation right now and I think um, we're always open to do more. Um, there's a book, I think it's at least a year old now, called, um, oh, it's Biased. And um, we're going to read that together as a congregation. And another thing, our parish has a, a community theater. And we don't know because of the virus if this will actually go forward, but in October we have scheduled the first production of a play called The Agitators, 
We think it's mostly just been produced in Washington, D.C. up to this point, and it's about the relationship with Frederick Douglass and Susan B. Anthony. Um, it takes on the issues of racism and feminism, and this was is to be produced in October, so if we're able, because of the virus and the restrictions about um, gathering in large groups and being able to host that in the fall, we'll present that production to the community for four nights. Pastor Ben? I think uh, what will you do as a faith leader in your community to create meaningful change? I think that we definitely need to work on getting to know and reach across lines. Uh, I think an incredible book for anybody, uh, especially uh, uh, white people, is a book called White Fragility. If you're going to change your heart, that should be a standard read. You should you should read that book because it really, and it's, it's written by a Caucasian woman, but she really goes into detail uh, of, of why it's so challenging to change. Uh, another book is The New Jim Crow. Those are just books that will help to expand your thinking and begin to see from a different viewpoint. Mm -hmm. Because whatever you consistently feed yourself is what you will become. You know that. If you feed yourself candy all the time, you won't become fat. I can right. guarantee that. So what are you feeding yourself? And if you want to change your heart, change your diet. Mm -hmm. What do I mean? I'm not talking about what you eat, but I'm talking about what you consume, the knowledge that you take in. Read something from a different perspective so it allows your views to begin to expand and you no longer just see people in the narrow lane and the narrow window of which the media portrays them. But you begin mm -hmm. to see them as individuals and that's the beginning stages to begin to eradicate the racial disparities that have been a part of this country forever. Thank you. Deborah. I would like to look at this from, again, from the personal end, because as Dr. Van was saying, we have to change our hearts and to help people change their heart, um, to be a facilitator of that as, as a community leader, means having that openness, but also having that personal relationship to bring people forward into seeing the need for change. And to do that means education. You know, reading different books than um, what you've always read, taking on different projects from what you've done in the past, these things expand you as a person and expand those around you as they learn from you. And, you know, you say, oh, this book, I read it and wow, is it meaningful. And then they go read it. So it, it can become a very positive chain, but we do have to work on it. Thank you. Reverend Kirkendall? Well, I think uh, I had a chance to be out in the community yesterday in this, this season of protest and a chance to talk to some of our young protesters. And I'm so proud of them is the way they're standing up and they're protesting in a peaceful way. And, you know, and it's good to read the books. But after we read all the books that's going to help us with our diet and how to treat each other, we got to practice what we preach and teach and what we tell other people about. we got to get out and learn how to really love each other. It's one thing to be with me 10 minutes and tell me about the good book that you've read, but it's another thing to stand out and stand up for what we know is right. And I want to leave here today to say it's not a time in our country for us to stick our head in the sand and act as if there's not injustice going on, even in the White House. A lot of whether it's true or not, because if people believe it, they're going to treat it the same way. They feel like even in our White House, is so much racism there until they don't really know who to trust. For those of us who claim to love the Lord and to love God, we have to be the one that speak out against it. 
We have to be the one that encourages them. Don't let that one bad experience that you receive cause you to miss out on the good things of life by hating people. And I'll say it again, and I hope it makes sense to you. It's time for us to start trying to make an effort to try to get along, not just talk about it, but to be about it. Thank you. Sam, do you have some yeah, comments? I just want to say, I think it's time for us. I just want to say on behalf of Global Faith in Action and all of us, thank you. This has been a great experience. I, um, I think there is a field where we are all going to come together and that's what we need to do. You've certainly shared so much tonight. We thank you so much and uh, may we continue to work together to address all this that we have been facing and talking about today and all that's happening in our community and in our world. We need people like you. We need to come together. You've done it tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Chelsea, for the idea and for pushing us to do this. And Sarinda, thank you for uh, managing and facilitating this whole thing. Thank you very much, everybody. It was great. I got a quick question for, uh, for Don. How can I be a part of that discussion about your book you're reading? Um, well, you can look for it on our Facebook page. It uh, okay. will be there. Um, it's not there yet. So, um, and okay. we got another um, suggestion tonight about which book to read first. So, um, <laughs> Maybe we'll read biased and maybe we'll read white fragility. But okay. um Which Facebook is that? Have, we will have this um the plan was to have about a four session uh, book group on Zoom and we'll provide information about how to be there to be part of it. Would that be on your uh, on that face on our global face in action? It's Saint James Wichita. Saint James Wichita. S.T. James Wichita. Great. Thank you very much. Uh -huh. And we had several other questions come on um, through Facebook. Um, so we'll do our best to somehow address those, Sam, and we might just be in contact with each of you uh, to perhaps uh, respond to those in writing so we can at least uh, let people know that we're listening and responding to them. Yeah. It's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, again, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks to you all. Thank you. Have Bye. a good night. Stay and safe, guys. Thank you. And thank you to all who've been listening out there in the community. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.